6.30, just uh, less than a minute left, few seconds. In fact, just turned 6.30. So let us keep the tradition of starting on time. Uh, people can still join and understand what is happening, but we don't have to wait for that. So uh, first of all, as I put in my <coughs> uh, announcement, uh, uh, this is no fixed agenda. It is not that three lectures, five lectures, six lectures, all that will depend on how our interaction goes, how much interest is there and what questions are asked. Okay. So um, at least from next session onwards, uh, today after you get introduced, I would uh, uh, be very happy to answer questions. Today also I'll be happy, but I expect you to start ask, uh, asking questions definitely in the next session. And uh, if you think there's something long you want to say, you could also send me as an email uh, uh, to my CMI address and uh, put uh, you know questions about cephalogy or some such thing in the uh, subject so that I don't lose track of that. Okay. Now, I don't know. There were two, three versions of the announcement. So uh, I don't know uh, which one are, uh, have you seen. By, by you, I mean, in general, people who are on the session. So, in uh, one of the announcements, uh, which I had written after, it was a, probably only at CMI student, but few students wrote to me saying, what is the background? What background or what do they uh, need to know? Prerequisites of a course. So, uh, I had replied that there is no prerequisite. Uh, and uh, I had written that... Uh, basic awareness of Indian political system will be useful, will be helpful. So uh, I've given examples. Firstly, that the country is divided into various constituencies. And in a given parliamentary election, uh, each constituency, a few candidates are there and the voters choose one. And whoever gets the maximum vote gets elected. Okay, this is one part. Uh, in the election of state assembly, the state is divided into constituencies and the same rule is applied, sometimes called uh, first past the post. Or Then every political party has one candidate, in, at most one candidate in each constituency. They don't have to put candidates in every constituency, but they can have at most one candidate in each constituency. And a candidate is called an independent candidate if he or she is not a candidate of any political party. Now, some of you who read it earlier may have been amused that what kind of background have I uh, uh, prerequisite I have written. And those who had not seen it, you would be amused now that these are basic things, but that's all that we need. Now, you might think, why did I think of uh, putting these three conditions or these three prerequisites? So, as those who have attended my course, especially in the online mode, know that I like to give some stories, real stories from the past in my lectures. And uh, I will have lots of them in these opinion poll or uh, cephalogy lectures. So let me start off with a story that why did I write down these three conditions? So if going back in time, uh, uh, maybe about 15, 12 to 15 years ago, before I came to CMI, but after I had left ISI, uh, I was doing work with uh, CNN, IB, and a television channel, Rajdeep Sardesai's TV channel, and we were doing opinion polls. And uh, they they would have a team which is supposed to be doing the graphics for uh, whatever happens uh, during the program when they are doing opinion poll or counting day, etc. And there are a whole lot of errors. Some of the, them are still there. They were more than now a bit less, but they still have errors. Basic information they put on uh, the, the, the screen and there can be cal computational errors in that. So one of the tasks we had proposed to the uh, channel was that uh, I will also supervise that part. So they said, no problem, sir. We have engaged a, a, a team. We have got a contract with the company. They have uh, put in a 20-member committee to whom who are going to do all this work. So you can uh, tell them what to do. So I had a meeting with them in cal Delhi. And I told them a basic things, you know, what data we will collect, how they have to process, what outputs we will need, blah, blah, blah. They said, no problem, sir. Next week, we will have come with you with a, a design of our data system that we'll create various things. I said, okay. 
So uh, next week when we I met them, I had gone them uh, gone with some dummy data, some cooked up data to just test what they do. And their outputs made no sense. Their whole thing was making no sense. So I said, okay, show me what are you doing. And they did not understand or the, the team and the team, these are all engineers, uh, IT engineers for uh, uh, maybe 50, 10 of them or 12 of them, whatever. And the three things which I put, they were not sure. They did not know. So the first thing I discovered was that the database they had imagined or whatever they had created. It, there were tons of political parties, there were tons of constituencies, and then there were tons of candidates, thousands of each. So each party can put thousands of candidates in each can constituency. And so on. So obviously it made the whole thing too complex and unnecessary. And what that means is that it takes time in processing. Of course, the computing systems were not so powerful as they are today. Uh, software was not as good as it is today. And on top of that, uh, their design was poor. So I had to tell them that, no, 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 no. Each, uh, each constituency, there is a party can have only one candidate. So they were all take, looking at me. As if, oh, is that really true? So they were not aware of that. All right. So they did that. Next week when I went, they were still having a problem. And I, with my dummy data, things were just not working out. Because their, their data would have, uh, you know, parties and uh, uh, <clears throat> alliances and they have to take uh, some of, if they can pro project a uh, graph with the parties uh, uh, or with uh, <clears throat> alliances. And things were just not adding up. 543 constituencies, when we go to alliance, their total is going to weigh above 543. I said, what kind of thing is there? Then I sit with them and do dig, uh, dig it. And then I realized that they thought that independent is name of a party. And they did not know that each con candidate can only be part of one party. So if I say it's some, my dummy data said somebody won from Chennai, and uh, you know, so uh, then it will, if you're independent, then uh, the, and somewhere else, uh, independent is part of one alliance, it will get counted there. And somewhere else, the independent is a, a, part, a member of some other alliance, that will get added there. So, In any case, I, I don't think uh, those of you who are here would be falling in that but uh, category. But still, those who wondered why I put this as prerequisite, uh, here is the explanation. All right. So <clears throat> uh, that was my story. All, all stories I give uh, generally, and certainly this, uh, session, uh, this series of lectures are going to be all real events, no, no cooked up stories because there were tons of them with me. All right. So let's come to our uh, thing. Uh, as I've announced, we are going to meet every week on Friday and we will go as long as there is interest and there is material. So, all right. So uh, I had not put any title, but uh, in all the talks that I give elsewhere, there are tons of them which are available on YouTube if you are interested, you can, but unnecessary because I will be talking about most of these things here. But generally, I give a title and most often, more often than not, I have given this as power and limitation of opinion polls, just to let everybody aware right in the day one or first lecture, first, before even the session begins that I'm not just going to say that how great are opinion polls and this it can do this, it can do that. It also comes with limitations. It is not the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Okay. All right. So we'll keep that in mind. And... So, a common question uh, which is asked is, uh, how can obtaining opinion of say 40,000 voters be sufficient to predict the outcome of a country with over 91 crore votes? 20 years ago when I started, it was closer to 35, 35 crores or 40 crores. And now, uh, 2019, I have checked today, uh, the actual registered voters with election commission data were 91 crores, 19 lakhs, 50,000, blah, blah, blah. And actually, over 61 crore voters voted, 67.4% voters voted, okay? Uh, so the question could be, and 40,000 is an upper bound. I think the maximum that I have had 
in all these years of uh, conducting opinion polls uh, is somewhere closer to 35 or 37,000, never even 40,000. So the question naturally in the eyes of everybody is that uh, how can knowing this give me any clue about what is going to happen in the country? And of course, uh, there, there are people who say that, ah, you are like the others you have become, you have joined like the others who just come and say whatever they want to say. They translate their belief on screen and they say that it is the opinion of the people. Okay, so uh, well, they can, each one is uh, free to have their his or her own view. But uh, the purpose of this is to kind of tell you what is behind all this and what is the power that I talked about and what is the limitation. Okay. All right. So another question that we will definitely discuss, uh, there will be more, but if I forget this, I put this here because if I forget, uh, you do remind me and do opinion polls conducted well ahead of time, of the polling date, say a month ahead, have a predictive power as far as final results are concerned. So right now elections are on in several states and because the first phase of UP has begun, uh, all opinion polls and their analysis is on the freeze. People can conduct opinion polls, but they cannot go on air to say that opinion, our poll says this. That is the law now. And uh, people will do polls, but they will not publish it. They cannot publicize it, what they say. So all of the, I think, polls, uh, last thing was last week, someday, and it stopped then. Of course, then also those who come on air uh, say, essentially make you believe that this is what they think is going to happen. And I strongly feel that no. Uh, polls, uh, opinion polls done ahead of time, ahead of polling date, and especially given this multi-phase elections in UP, I guess uh, maybe half the state would be going to polls at least two, three weeks after the poll was done. So uh, they do not have predictive power as far as final results are concerned. So this is something we'll spend time out in a later session, but this is an extremely important point and in currently also relevant that don't take that what has been said in the uh, polls announced last week, even if the polls were accurate, there can be problems there, but even if they are the best, they do not really have predictive power. Okay, but uh, what are the objectives of opinion polls? So the, uh, as some of you may know if, or may have heard, and if not, you will know now that I started off as an all and all theoretician. Not quite a, well, I consider a probabilist or a, a statistician also as a mathematician. But if you do a three way uh, classification of uh, mathematician, statistician, and probabilist, then I was as a probabilist. And within probability, there are various shades. And uh, I was a theoretician and mostly working with infinite dimensional. Uh, uh, very infinite dimensional issues. So, in fact, uh, some of my friends in those days used to tell Rajiv lives in a Hilbert space because a whole lot of my right papers are based on uh, things in happening in a Hilbert space. So, uh, from then, when I was called in uh, to do some work with opinion polls, uh, I, my starting point was, and as it should be with any statistical uh, exercise, what is the objective of whatever is being proposed to be done? Okay. So for a nationwide opinion poll in India, so I, my, my comments and my opinions and comments and all the stories are all vis-a-vis -vis India. The same things do happen elsewhere, but there are differences. We'll come to that now and then. But my thing is focus is India. So in a nationwide opinion poll in India, the objective is to predict the number of seats for major political parties in the parliament. One important is question to answer is, which party or a pre-election alliance of parties will get the maximum number of seats in the house? And will that number be more than majority mark? If it is more than they form a government, if not, they have to have further coalitions and all kinds of things happen. So those uh, who, <coughs> Uh, track 
uh, elections and track uh, counting day, etc., etc. Uh, you know what how the results are announced and what is the way the government is formed. So um, the, op, the so the, what is not an option or what is not an objective rather the, the objective is not to predict who is going to win each seat. Okay, objective is to predict the overall seat thing at the Lok Sabha. Now, various people have asked me, well, unless you predict who is winning each seat, how will you add them up and say who is winning in the overall election? So, uh, well, the point is that uh, eventually, as you will see during the session lectures, that eventually we have to build a model and we do have to say, have somewhere that who is winning, let's say Chennai South, who is winning, Chennai North, who is winning, uh, 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 New Delhi, who is winning, uh, constituency I'm talking, okay. But the way it works is that our confidence, that our prediction is going to be close to reality for each individual seat is fairly poor. But it is all done in a statistical fashion that when you add them up and add, give the total nationwide total, we are fairly comfortable and fairly confident that we are not going to be far off the truth. So that is what I mean by the objective. The, the way I build that objective may have multi-steps, but I, I don't have to release those steps. I don't have to announce those things. So, um, on, on, on so I, I did appear in terms of uh, television channels and uh, actual announcement of this, uh, our outcome. And uh, people will ask, oh, who is winning here? I said, no, no, that we, we don't tell. Uh, they said, if you, unless you have that, how can you say who is going to win total? So, so, so I have to come up with some answer there on air, but uh, not revealed individual uh, seat wise. In fact, initially, I used to be reluctant in even giving the state wise uh, uh, breakups that, okay, all India, so it's, this is winning, but then let's come to Tamil Nadu, what are the, how much the winners are getting here, how much they are getting in UP, let's come to big states. I used to refuse even that. Later, I relented and started answering those as well. But the overall objective is to be kept in mind that it is to announce the nationwide picture. Second, the data is going to generate percentages of votes, but and we can announce those, but nobody remembers. And that is not the objective. Objective is seats and not percentage of votes. This is something which we uh, will talk about as we go later in the sessions. Okay. So let us start with the first question. How can obtaining opinion of 40,000 voters be sufficient to predict? So let, the nationwide, etc., etc., will come again later. Let's just come to a simple thing that how can any kind of statistical exercise of collecting data from some group of people tell you anything about what is going to happen in the entire population? And if we were, if I was doing a live uh, lecture someplace and everybody was sitting in the room, I would have done a, I used to, I have done in many places uh, a experiment and uh, now that last two years that I have done these talks on, in the online mode, I, it's convenient to use a, a clip from a, a talk which was done some time ago. So there I've chosen one from, which was given at Google London on the same theme about five years ago. And whole thing is uh, as a probability statistics background and uh, this slide uh, deliberately I've kept it blank. It doesn't mean no background needed, but uh, we'll do it uh, live. What background is needed? So what I have with me is just a cardboard box and what it has are 100 slips of paper, okay? identical in all aspects. And uh, each one has a letter written on it, either A or a B. So you trust me on that. And then I mix them thoroughly and uh, come to the audience and someone whom I have never met before, I ask you to pick up one. You can pick from the top, bottom, anywhere. Okay. All right. Can you read out and yeah. A. A. So you, uh, you believe that we have not fixed this uh, event and uh, one was drawn out of this box after mixing and that one read an A. Now, uh, it's just based on this information. If you were to make a call, uh, oh, I forgot to say that there are 99 of them which have one letter and exactly one which is an outlier. 
Okay. So either we have only two possibilities, 99 A's and 1 B or 99 B's and 1 A. Just based on this observation that it was uh, one was drawn out after mixing, etc., etc., and that was an A. If you have to make a guess between the two possibilities, which is the likely possibility? 99A and 1B or 99B and 1A? 99A. So, a <clears throat> uh, few people answered. Others may have made up their mind but didn't answer. But uh, if one tries to go at the background as to what went in your mind when you picked this alternative, of course, the simplest explanation is just common sense. What is there? Okay. Uh, People who have had some statistics background or probability background may compute probabilities of the two scenarios and compare. They have even uh, sold on the Bayesian uh, philosophy. They would compute, a, put a prior and compute a posterior and say that the posterior probability of getting it this, this right is 99%. So they'll go with the, whichever one turned up is your answer, right? Okay, so uh, it's fun to do this experiment. And uh, if I'm giving it to students, more people answer. And uh, if it is to students, I tell them that if it is part of a course, I would, uh, if you give correctly answer, you will get one day extra for the next assignment. If you give wrong answer, no penalty. And then of course, everybody wants to make a guess. And almost always, the guess is the letter which was seen. If you think about it, there is absolutely no reason to see pick the other letter. Okay, each one may have a different uh, way of assign arrive, uh, arriving at uh, that letter. As if A was observed, then say that A is the one which is ninety nine percent. Your logic may be different, but basically it is there. Okay, so <clears throat> if anybody would like to say something or ask something, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask. But I may not be tracking the <clears throat> uh, chat that closely, but uh, if you have put on chat and I have not looked at it, you can unmute yourself and ask. Okay. Okay. So this 99 and 1 is something which is I have deliberately chosen so that if you pick the winner, then somebody would say chances of it being right is this, the right, wrong is that, like a Bayesian one. Okay. Now let's move on. And if instead of 99 having one letter, if only 95 have one letter and five have the other letter. Okay. So <clears throat> meaning either, so you have two options, nine, 95 A's and five B's or 95 B's and five A's. Okay. And now, we say we draw three times and apply a rule, go with the majority. So we didn't go to two draws because if it one says A, one says B, you don't know. You, you know, you have nothing to uh, guess which one is the right answer. Okay. It's 50-50. As good as not doing the experiment. So doing two draws, you may end up in that. So instead of that, if you draw three times, then you can have the go with the majority. Very likely all three will be the same, but even if there is one outlier, the two have to match and <clears throat> you can now see that the, I'm not going to define what exactly I mean by accuracy level. Accuracy level was 99% in the first try. Namely, if 99 are one letter and one is the other letter and you decide to go with the winner, the chances are 99%. You can compute them in a Bayesian framework or just uh, natural computation in your mind or common sense. All right. So that's a vague description of uh, accuracy level I've given. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, then the same translates to uh, here 0.99275. If you go with the winner, go with the majority rule, so you have to compute uh, in all you have 100 times 100 times 100, that many possible uh, things and uh, all three coming with the winner, all, all three coming from the winner group are 95, 95, 95 times. And then one other one and two winner group are this. So, so the ratio is 0 0.99275, which is actually more than 0 
so we can uh, with this we can say that uh, i'll do three tries and my rule is go with the winner so so there is a multiple things to learn here one is that when you are doing a statistical experiment you should have come up with what you are going to do as analysis before you see the data after you get the data you can only do whether there are errors in data collection whether there is something which has gone wrong but you should not come up with a what algorithm you are going to use on that data after you have got the data because if you do that then it is like you know you have, you, you want to uh, somehow uh, have a view yourself and you want to put an algorithm which will uh, sub, sub, uh, substantiate your view so it's important you know statistical analysis that uh, one should uh, ideally choose an algorithm before now it may happen that there is an error in your algorithm and you discover because you tried to feed a data it is giving a weird answer and then you analyze and see that there was some problem in your algorithm then it's a different issue but ideally okay so so once again we draw three times and 95 has the doc and we apply the majority rule go with the whoever is winner out in this three draws you say that that person or that entity is going to be the winner you will be as good or better than what happened first round now if the gap is closer so 90 98% gap 99 and 1 we reduce to 90% because 95 5 uh, by the way if instead of 95 5 you have 96 4 or 97 3 it doesn't matter so we should say that the winner is at least 95 rather than exactly 95 and 5 that one letter has at least 95 and the other letter may have at most 5 okay uh, the the analysis is the same so if the gap is closer Uh, I'll come to a closer gap later. So the next slide is saying, now, if instead of 100 slips of paper, let's say we have 1,000, out of which 950 having one letter and 50 having another. Okay. We, how many slips should we draw? So we were drawing three slips. How many now we should draw so that we can, the go with majority rule still gives us 99% accuracy. Okay. This is a question. With, with 100, we could see that three draws will give you 99% accuracy. If out of 100, what we should do? And how, if instead of uh, instead of 1,000, we have now 10,000, OK? And people who have had some this thing with statistics, they'll say, huh, it, it could go up with uh, n as a multiple of n. So you should get first one, it should be 30. And next one, it should be uh, 300. Or you have square root rule. If you have figured out that some of these expansions happen at a square root level, you will compute and say what it is. The answer is surprising. Mm -hmm. And not so surprising once you see the, uh, the idea as to why it is the answer. But And believe it, lots of people who get into arguments with me about opinion polls and related election-related stuff, this is one major point that uh, the answer is going to be three draws in both these cases are still going to give you the same accuracy. And people say, how can it be? Three out of 10,000 is nothing. And not just 10,000. Even if you raise it to 1 lakh, 10 lakh, a million, a billion. If the split is 95-5 or better in the favor of winner, and you're picking things randomly, under these two conditions, three draws will suffice no matter what is your population size. And even people who have done PhD in statistics a decade ago have gotten into argument with me on this issue. They forget what they have learned. Okay. So here is a thing for 10,000. Okay. So we, we had arrived at 99% from the, this ratio. So total number of uh, groups that you can choose by picking one, then I, uh, put back again one, then put back again one. So 100, 100, 100. Out of which, if, if the letter which has the dominant one, uh, how many out of these uh, uh, 100 times 100 times 100 will give you the correct uh, solution, correct answer? 
and the ratio numerator is there and that ratio is 99. Now, the same rule if you apply, here you have 1000, 1000, 1000, here you have 950, 950. So 95 becomes 950 and 5 becomes 50. Of course, this 3 doesn't become 30. This 3 comes from the number of trials. But the ratio is still 99, 2750, right? And this such a simple explanation is what tells you that it is the sample size and not sample proportion. The sample proportion is three out of how many? Okay. So sample size three rather than three out of how many? That is three divided by M. Where if M is the total, M doesn't count. Indeed, I already said that M that, you know, uh, even if the size is M, the ratio, the formula will translate like this and you will still get 0 0.992750. Sir? Yeah. I didn't get the sense behind accuracy, sir. So can you please explain that? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, so let's say to begin with, you have you have two possibilities. A, so let's say for, for discussion's sake, okay. Uh, let me say that uh, okay. Let me say that A is the winner, okay, and <clears throat> accuracy. So you have two possibilities in our sample. A could be the dominant one or B could be the dominant one. And uh, in the population, we know A is the winner. That is our start starting point. We just fix whatever, whoever is the winner, let's call it A. All right. And in our sample, uh, after our sampling in our algorithm, uh, our, our process, you could either have A or a B. Now, uh, you can do uh, uh, standard analysis such as uh, you have uh, two possibilities and you have uh, two outcomes. Uh, you can match or you can be doing the other one. So when you are right, what are the chances that you will get the right answer? What was the chance you will get a wrong answer? In, if you do that, you will get 99% uh, right and 1% wrong. If you give B Bayesian, then you can start by saying that uh, a priori you have, your, you, you don't have, so your prior is 50% A is winner and 50% B is the winner. Then uh, your algorithm tells you that A is the dominant one in your data, okay? Then you compute the posterior probability and you will get that A is the winner with probability 99% posterior probability. So that is the accuracy. So that is the best way of thinking Bayesian, but even without Bayesian, one can go through some Rigma role and come out with a notion of uh, accuracy. I hope I answered your question. Who asked the question, please? Can you uh, me? sir. I talk. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So that is the sense of accuracy I'm talking about. Okay. Mm. And <clears throat> so mm, strictly speaking, if people, uh, so, uh, so I, I told you I'm a probabilist and I became a statistician or only an applied statistician because till date I have not written a single paper in theoretical statistics. So I'm a probabilist and an applied statistician, but none of what I have written has anything to do with Bayesian. So people say, oh, are you against Bayesian? No, I'm not against Bayesian, but I'm, I don't quite agree with everything that Bayesians uh, say. Okay. They, they, some of the things they say are not, uh, I, I, I don't, uh, but in most of my thinking like this one and giving explanations, I use, I unconsciously, but I use Bayesian ideas. Okay. So, so those of you who have learned this thing about Bayesian or are learning and have read and heard about Bayesian versus uh, uh, the traditional one, uh, we can talk about it later, but not today. Okay. So I, I hope I conveyed the idea of what I mean by accuracy and good somebody asked me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Now, 
yet another point which comes and some of these things have come to me over a period of time but uh, so this calculation which i showed where i put 95 5 etc this corresponds to what is called sampling with replacement that means when you are drawing three you pick one you observe whatever you want to observe for that sample, that uh, observation okay then put it back in the bundle so if i am doing through 100 slips out of a, a box and i am doing three times then i after the one thing is read i put it back shake it up again and then go to uh, somebody else in the scene uh, <clears throat> So at least I think in one of the YouTube clips available, uh, a talk given at Pune University, uh, I did this three times as well. Okay, so that is corresponds sampling with replacement. So the second person who is drawing is again drawing out of hundred slips, okay, and sampling with replacement. And if you don't do that, namely. You have seen what is one, then you go and next time you person draws only out of the remaining ninety nine. That is called sampling without replacement. Okay, and <clears throat> uh, there we'll come to that now. In theory or in doing computations, it is convenient to take uh, sampling with replacements because uh, the answers are very amenable to algebra. Okay. The successive observations turn out to be independent, and you can do various things with them at one go. Whereas clearly, if you are doing without replacement, then they are not independent. If the first one was red, next time you have one less red but equal uh, the uh, the same number of the other color, and vice versa. So, if you do without replacement, the successive draws are not independent, and the analysis can be little more tricky. Not very, but can be. So. Uh, most of the writings are with sampling with replacement, but now you imagine that I am actually doing an opinion poll. It could be in your the place you are. There is a, uh, I mean, most of the people in the uh, session are uh, ISI CMI students, so you are used to a small group. But let's say a, a university like Delhi University or somewhere where their elections are hotly contested and there are large number of People voting or JNU nearby, ISI Delhi, uh, Calcutta University again hotly contested polls in Chennai. I have not heard much about the poll in the university, but Delhi, Calcutta, yes. So <clears throat> a few, few, few hundred or thousand, etc., whatever, and we are doing a poll there. I have, I have engaged and I am doing. Now. I have enrolled you as one of my enumerators. You go and are standing outside, and as people are coming out, you are talking to them, or rather, go, going doing door to door home poll. You you go uh, a pre-election poll. Now, if I give you samples, I, I tell you that you know I, here is a list of hundred you uh, slips. You draw one slip. Uh, uh, catch that uh, respondent, ask that respondent the question, then put the uh, list back again, do sh shaking and pull out. Now, imagine what would happen if the second draw or the third draw is the same as the one you have done earlier. You go to a person, say this, to begin with, a lot of people may be reluctant to answer. Even if they have answered, you go again, they say, didn't you ask me already? It will You will look stupid if you answer. That yeah yeah but you appeared in my sampling exercise twice. The person is going to say my opinion is not going to change because I appeared twice, right? So it would be really ridiculous to do sampling in with replacement because you are not going to get any additional data. So your exercise of that sample has been wasted. Generating that sample is wasted. Be it talking to a person, be it something in industry where you were. Each thing has a cost in terms of time and maybe something else as well. So in practice, you would never undertake sampling with replacement. And when I learned this in, a, in my master's, when the teacher said, we we'll learn both these things, though it is always sampling without replacement, I said, then why are you teaching a sampling with replacement if it is no good? All right. So the reason is that it's easier to do analysis with sampling with replacement because the successive draws are independent. Whereas 
In practice, we are going to do sampling without replacement. But the two are connected, as I will explain to you in a minute. All right. So let's now. Uh, we had seen that in sampling with replacement, what I called accuracy computed by the first uh, displayed formula here uh, was this identity or this computation. Now, what would that change to if we are doing sampling with replacement? Sorry. Uh, I think my uh, this thing is wrong. This should have come here. This is for sampling with replacement that we did. Now, in sampling without, I should have said in sampling with replacement, this equation will be replaced by this equation. So, nine, so now it is 95, 94, 93. So if you get all three from the dominant group, all A's, if A is the winner, then it is 95 out of 100. Denominator should have gone to 90. Ah, this is my typing mistake today. So this should have become 195, 199, 98. And numerator is 95, 94, 93. Sorry about this. And if I was doing this on iPad, I would have corrected it on screen. Now I can't. I can still do that. Okay. I can. Unless it flags an error, it will correct here. Yeah. So this is this is the number I was looking at. And you you can see that actually this number increases though very marginally okay so uh, the reason is that in sampling with without uh, with replacement though our uh, sample size is 3 occasionally effectively it amounts to the analysis with only sample size 2 or even sample size 1 with small probabilities and uh, one can keep debating that as uh, you can even those who are uh, studied these things a little they can themselves write down a proof that why Sampling without replacement, the uh, accuracy will always be more than sampling with replacement. Okay. All right. And this holds in general. So easy to show that sampling without replacement in this particular exercise always improves accuracy. All right. Now, if the gap is higher, say 80-20, or 60, 40, or 55, 45, we can increase the sample size and hope to achieve the required accuracy. So remember, 99.1 to 95.5, we went from 1 to 3. Okay, As the gap reduced, we had to increase the size of our number of draws we were doing, the number of times you conducted the experiment. So this is only a hope. Right now, there is no reason, but we hope that uh, it will increase and we will prove that mathematically that you can increase sample size and reach a size where you will get required accuracy. Now, essentially, this is the only idea from probability theory or statistics that is relevant to most of our answers. Okay, So the idea is that if you are picking at random out of a uh, one group, then probability that an individual gets selected in, is the same across all and then you can if you can count how many then you can compute what are the probabilities of getting this answer that answer this is the only idea all right so now uh, since i'm mainly addressing it to students i've come back to a framework where i'm using some equations and few equations and uh, <clears throat> symbols I had started this way, but over a period of time, when I started giving like popular lectures on this, I had replaced all this with only loose talk. But that was also compressed only in one, uh, one lecture of 100 hours. I mean, one lecture of one hour. We have no such upper bound, so we can expand on in both directions. So let's say we consider we fix a constituency, Chennai South. And to make matters simple, if they never are, let's suppose there are two candidates, A and B. Only two candidates. Suppose there are M voters, M known to us total. And by voters, we mean voters appearing in the election commission list. No debate about what is a voter. All right. And let's call them V1, V2, Vm. All right. Suppose K out of M voters prefer A to B, and little p is K by M is the proportion of voters that prefer A to B. We don't know what K 
k is and therefore we don't know what little p is but these are these are our notation and our aim is to make some judgment about p little p all right interest is in deciding if k is bigger than m by 2 or k is less than m by 2 that is uh, we assume for simplicity that m is a odd integer if it is even both can be equal so let's just assume him is a odd integer. After all, the real number of voters is in lakhs and thousands and lakhs and crores, uh, depending on what number you are counting. Most constituencies, at least Lok Sabha, uh, most constituencies have more than hundred thousand uh, voters. Okay, more than a lakh. That is who is, the aim is to decide who is going like predict who is going to win the election. I have already said that eventually we will go over to only nationwide but right now we are focusing on one constituency and one so we have to win uh, if you were going to conduct in one constituency the aim would be to predict who will be the winner okay of course if we observe opinion of each voter we will know the answer but the whole point is can you do it for less so can we have a decision rule that even if you observe opinion of only a few voters and Few voters obtained via, it is said in our experiment, that is done via randomized picking up of the sample. Okay. So, some more notation. And a small story when I came to this slide. So, ages ago when I just started doing opinion poll analysis, so I started in 98. This could be 98 or at most 99. So just a year after, I was invited to give a colloquium talk at TIFR Bombay. This was the first invitation I had for a colloquium talk at TIFR Bombay. And uh, the invitation was from a friend of mine, V. Srinivas, who is currently the NBHM chairman. Uh, I knew him well ahead of... When both of us were BSc students, we attended a summer school together. So. Uh, so he invited me. So I asked him, you know, what should I speak on? I could uh, give a popular talk on this opinion poll business or I could give some theoretical talk on uh, probability theory. But then I know that the TIFR, there would be hardly anybody interested in that. So what should I speak on? So he says, it is your choice and this opinion poll should be fine because he also agreed that probability theory, there will be nobody at least at that time. Now it has changed. But at that time, there was hardly anyone in a TIFR who would be interested in listening to what I had to say on probability. So I picked this. And uh, of course, then I had to think about at least bringing in some mathematical notations, equations, and this is what I came up with. Postscript to this story, that it came to good use. Namely, uh, uh, one of my uh, colleagues that I, I spent 20 plus years at ISI Delhi as faculty member and one of my colleagues there, like me, uh, he has also retired now, Rajendra Bhatia. Uh, so we had been friends uh, and uh, we never did any work together. Certainly we would talk mathematics, but we never wrote any paper together. And later years, when, when I was at CMI, I would be going to Delhi every now and then and meet friends, meet Rajendra also. And, so he was talking about some problem he was having about matrices and uh, uh, how do you define distance between two matrix in a non-Euclidean space, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not digressing on to that, but and he said that, you know, there is some uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, there is a paper, but which is almost impossible for us to read. Us means most people who are mathematicians and do only linear algebra because it has all to do with measure theory in infinite dimensions. And uh, so I said, why should measure theory in infinite dimensions be needed for the problem you're talking? Because you're talking about uh, distance between two matrices, finite matrices, distance computed slightly differently. So I looked at the paper and that evening, and then I realized that, you know, all that is not needed. It can be done very elementary fashion. And what came to rescue to convey the, my answer to Rajendra was, what we are going to do, see now. And believe me, uh, eventually that thing came out as a first 
joint paper I have written with Rajendra Bhatia and appeared in the major uh, uh, journal and it is referenced a lot subsequently. So, so never, even if it is very elementary and very simple, if you are writing something new, just keep it in mind because you never know when it will be useful. All right. So, uh, I have only 10 more minutes. I will keep this each one to be just one hour. I won't, if it is just one session, I used to have a tendency of extending a little, not too much, but today we'll do it. So let S denote the collection of n tuples, I1, I2, In, of in elements of 1 to M. Uh, so this is with replacement. So repetition is allowed. Okay. So for one tuple I1, I2, In, let us define two functions, F, I1, I2, In, and G. Uh, oh, I, did I say that? What is little a? Oh, I, it should have been there somewhere. Little a of I is, uh, is a, a little a, a. This is a function from S to 0, 1. So each little a is either 0 or 1. Okay. So F, I1, I2, In is simply counting the number of ones in your sample, if I call each individual thing as a sample, and G is the proportion. So total N outcomes out of which how many are one, what proportion are one. So, so once again, this little a, I will, I should have written here. This is uh, for each S, each element S, you have a, either a zero or a one. Each little a of an index is zero or one. All right. So F is the number or and G is the proportion of ones in your sample. All right. The aim is to estimate the following object. So let's look at the numerator. Numerator is number of tuples or elements in S such that the proportion of ones in, the, in these and, and little p. Little p is the proportion in the total. The difference is at most epsilon. And we divide it by the total number of uh, that your uh, tuples, so m power n. Each, yeah, each S, the size is M. So the total number of tuples is M power N. And this is uh, proportion of tuples in which the difference between uh, the proportion, uh, observed proportion and little p is at most epsilon. Now, it, can, it is easy to see high school algebra and therefore I'm sure all of you can do it. Some can do it quickly. Some may take a little time to just get together with this notation. Uh, but so uh, the video as well as this uh, the PDF of the, the lecture notes, whatever I, is on screen, I will upload and make it available. The information, I will see how to put it to you all or certainly it will be available uh, uh, by next week. Okay. So you can take a look at uh, it. Sir? Yes. Uh, quick clarification. So uh, are we trying to find the uh, number of elements of S such that uh, the G of I1, I2, I n minus P is at least epsilon or at most epsilon? Uh, I, I was a little confused. Oh, that the gap is more than epsilon. Eventually, you want to find at least epsilon. If you can't find this, you will know how many is at least epsilon also. No? Total is just one. Right? Okay, sure. Yeah. So, uh, this is uh, we, this will give a measure of error. So, okay. So, uh, all right. So you can easily see that the summation of f i one i two i n over all of them is going to give you n k m n minus one. It's like if, if what are the contributions coming from the? This is just i one plus i two plus i m uh, a i one i two i m, and uh, you can do a counting that. Uh, if you are focusing on a i one, their sums uh, that is k, and the other ones are all possibilities, and that way each one is m. So uh, you can come out with this number. All right. And sum of squares. Uh, so if a is zero or one, uh, the square is also zero or one. Uh, but there can be the, 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 uh, the square terms. This whole, uh, the square terms will be exactly the same, but cross product terms, we have to do counting and then you can see that it is this, all right? So from this calculation, you can come out very easily, uh, this ratio, 
that when you divide by m power n, then g, this is little p, and this one comes to p power n plus this, and it follows that uh, 1 over m power n summation, this square is p, p minus 1 by n. Now, some of you will say, sir, why are you doing this? It will follow from binomial theorem. Yes, a binomial distribution. Yes, it will. The point is, uh, when speaking to or conveying this to people who are outside your statistics domain or probability mathematics domain, probability domain, if you use a theorem, they are turned off. They say, we don't know what all assumptions your theorem makes. We don't understand your theorem. So they, 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 we don't believe what you're writing. They don't say we don't believe, but they close their mind. So it is always better to try to come up with arguments which are accessible to the largest number of group, largest number percentage in the group whom you are addressing. So TIFR, I didn't want to use any theorem in probability theory. So I did this. This is simple algebra calculation. Then it is kosher. It is fine with them. All right. So and then uh, using this ratio, now you will say this is just uh, <coughs> Chebyshev's inequality, but to an audience with pure math audience, this is fine. Using this equation, we can see that this proportion can at most be 1 over epsilon square p1 minus p by n. And if this is not true, then the previous equality would be violated. If there is more than this proportion inside this, uh, uh, then that thing, each of them will contribute at least epsilon and that will violate this. So, simplest case of Chebyshev's uh, can be used to prove it if you want, but uh, you, most of you have done this in a first course in probability and you don't need a proof. But I was just conveying the advantage, as I said, was that in this work with Bhatia that I did, we were in a framework where we tried to use it, where none of the theory could be applied, and uh, but these calculations were still valid. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So, if we wish to choose n such that for epsilon equal to 0 0.05, we want that this pr proportion is less than equal to 0 0.01. That means uh, how much sample size should I choose so that the my estimate and the true number are differing less than 5%. And I want that my error, I'm allowed to do error at most 1%. Of course, you will say that you want zero error. Well, if you want zero error, then your sample size, no sample size will do it unless you do it for all. Okay. And in sampling without, uh, with replacement, it will never be 100%. In without replacement, if you do sample size the same as population size, it is one. You can get it correctly and therefore this is zero. But short of that, so most statistical estimates, the error should be noted in two parts. How much error you should be, uh, the error should be at most so much and error probability should be at most so much. Okay. All right. So now the problem is how should we choose n so that we have at most 5% deviation and uh, we should be right with 99% probability. And so therefore, uh, we can now put down the things. So we should choose a n so that for epsilon equal to 0 0.05, we should have this ratio. And a simple thing, of course, you will get the answer as n equal to 10,000. So if you have a 10,000 sample size, then you can, this calculation shows that uh, your error probability is at most 1% and error is defined as this ratio exceeding 0.05. Important, even if the population size is 1 billion, this will be true. Okay. Doesn't matter what is the population size. We have written, the proof is given here mathematically. Okay. So, uh, of course, this 10,000 is overkill. You don't need 10,000. This is upper bound after all. We have just estimated some ratios and given upper bound. So if you want to really come, uh, what is the best epsilon you can, what is the smallest epsilon, 
which you can choose to come to this numbers okay uh, can we do better okay so if we assume that the winner has that so we now in coming to the reality we need to put some number about okay the winner is at least 53% votes if you say the winner is getting just 1% one vote more than the loser then again uh, you no know, uh, unless your sample size is nearly the entire community you cannot get a good estimate but if you assume that the winner is at least 53 has a 50 uh, has at least 53% votes and loser at most uh, 47% vote then what size of sample will uh, ensure that uh, sample winner is the true winner and accuracy 99% well i am stopping in a minute but you have three possibilities you can use approximate the probability using central limit theorem and by uh, normal approximation of binomial distribution or you can approximate this probability using simulation which is available today which was not available to me 20 years ago when i did it first simulation was available but not uh, large numbers okay and i didn't know it and uh, or we can compute the probability using software say python and because we have enough time in later sessions we are i'm going to explain how each of this could be done of course many of you know how it can be done and if you want to give the answer to me how you can do it you can send it share it with me but uh, i have used all three and i'll uh, come to each of them also next session so the idea we will move away later from one uh, assembly to overall what to do lots of issues get involved and we will uh, do them side uh, one by one and uh, so let me stop in a minute you can you are free to uh, share questions with me uh, by uh, writing a mail to me and uh, or ask me next time we meet next friday okay anything right now quick one i can answer though those who want to uh, leave with other things to do can leave but if there's some one question i can address it now but otherwise we'll do it next time sir what will be the case when like more than one party is involved like uh... yeah so uh, so the rules are similar basically you go with the winner okay and most important thing is when the top two the gap between the top two they should if it is very close you can't do much but if the gap between the top two is significantly good then you can continue whatever we are doing okay for one assembly uh, uh, predicting in one assembly now when you want to add it up then things get even more complicated and um, what we have seen is that uh, based on our data we will get some ordering that this candidate maximum next candidate next candidate in each constituency uh so initially our adding up constituencies and predicting nationwide was based on uh only two party analysis whichever were the top two in each constituency in our sample they were the only ones which i took into account and we saw that there were many places where what was third number 3 in our sample actually won so we modified our uh, whole process and uh, we accounted for and assigned things for top 3 yeah there have been rare occasions when the winner is the someone who was not in the top 3 so we ignored that okay so i hope i answered your question nowadays winning percentage is approximately 35 to 37% if we see so when no, wait, we... winning percentage of party or winning percentage uh, of the amount of votes collected by one individual party is approximately 37 to 38% you are talking each constituency wise or the nationwide nationwide ah oh nationwide we will discuss nationwide things it comes later right now we are talking about the picture about uh, constituency wise yeah so, but if if we take probabilistically that will be the model followed by the whole nation um, no, no 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 it is not uniform i agree but partially it, somewhere it will be around uh, let's say maharashtra there is a probability that bjp wants 37% okay and uh, another party wants some the dynamics which we see 
so 37 then 35 and then there is a very close fight with respect to number of votes and so, yeah, yeah. so okay okay so you see uh, if it was a one session thing i would have had to have lots of uh, things packed in so today we are seeing in the best case scenario that uh, at least convincing that if you have to do sampling in one constituency and there, there are only two candidates and the gap is wide then we can do it with high probability okay okay yeah. now Thank you. all these three will be violated you know we want nationwide uh, they, they will be multiple candidates everywhere the gaps may not be this thin how to deal with each of these will come over a period of time okay sure these are all important issues okay sir yeah yeah uh, so sir in practice uh -huh. uh, do we correct for the uh, kind of sample that we have collected so for example if i'm connecting my sample uh, let's say from let's say by internet pool so then the sample is the one that is more likely to use internet things like that do we correct for that okay firstly i refuse to take that as a, a authentic pool okay for reasons we i will address later okay if i don't you uh, uh, do remind me when we come later to analysis because uh, what is most important is that this, the whole thing is dependent on how representative is the sample to the population you are interested in. And opinion poll done via internet is no good, in my view. Views differ. There are people who are doing things based on opinion polls, based on internet. They may be right, they may be wrong. Let them uh, defend their process. I can attack those process for reasons. Yeah. No, but I used internet just as an example. So, for example, I could have said that if you go and visit a marketplace in the evening, then those are the people who visit markets more often, things like that. Again, again, that. again I agree that that is the process followed by most agencies, what they call, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I forget their name, uh, Something which is not, never taught in a statistics course is the uh, is the sim, uh, thing what they use in marketing. Uh, but uh, uh, so so uh, the, the choosing the representative sample is the crux of the matter. And if you do any of these methods, you go to some uh, uh, go to the markets and get uh, conveniently quickly uh, data on large number of people. It may be right. It may be wrong. People come out with corrections uh, with that, and I'm not convinced of those. So uh, uh, the right thing to do would be to do randomized polls. And uh, that is what I have been practicing. And uh, I've conveniently, uh, I, fortunately, I was uh, I have worked with agencies which were willing to pay for it because it costs a lot more. OK. So all these issues uh, will come up. And those things cannot be corrected according to me. If you do a poll based on internet, if you do a poll which is domin prominently, you say half the poll is done like this and half of done is done via home-to-home uh, uh, -home poll, uh, poll and randomized sampling, then maybe, but not otherwise. Okay. And one more thing. So, uh, for example, we had the case of two candidates. So, uh -huh. uh, do we in practice attach different weights to different can uh, voters of different candidates, considering the fact that let's say B is more likely to vote than an A? Again, uh, that is something which people try to do, but very tricky, very tricky, and one could be wrong. So unless we are sure, the point is uh, in any such analysis, you can apply one of two algorithms or one of two assumptions or. If you are convinced that you are very sure about guessing who will be the right one and who will be the wrong one, or who will vote and who will not vote, you can take it into account, but that is very tricky. So I have, we have avoided doing that. Okay. People do it, such things. Yes, people do it. Uh, uh, most of the uh, uh, things are done for uh, well before the election starts. Now, when I said it has no meaning, it is for a media and when you want to do it for general public to, if election, uh, a political party 
is interested in pre-election poll because they want to use this data to do whatever they want to do. But that's a different question altogether. And uh, not that I refuse, but no one approached me or at least some people only talked to me but never really got to engage in a uh, thing. So I've never, therefore I can say that I've never done any poll for any party. If I had done for them, things would have been different for them. Okay, so thank you. Okay. All right. See you next Friday. Thank you, sir. Thank you.